We have a word in our English language we use to describe horrendous pain. It's the word excruciating. You're familiar with that word. That kidney stone was excruciating. It's pain, unbearable pain. But even though we use that word, most of us don't know the origin, the etymology of that word. Excruciating, ex, the prefix means out of. Crux, Latin for cross. Literally, excruciating means out of the cross. The physical pain associated with, with crucifixion was so horrible that a word had to be invented to describe it. Out of the cross came horrendous pain, but out of the cross also came our salvation. And that's the truth we're going to see in our final message from the Gospel of Luke. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Luke chapter 22. The high priest at the time of Jesus' trial was a man named Caiaphas. He was the high priest. Could I point out that for 1,900 years since the crucifixion of Jesus, there was never any evidence that there was ever a man named Caiaphas who even lived, much less was the high priest in Jerusalem? Critics of the Bible said, ah, that's just a myth. There's no confirmation of somebody named Caiaphas. Yet in 1990, in the city of Jerusalem, the tomb of Caiaphas was discovered. And the inscription of the tomb shows that he was the high priest exactly during the time of Jesus. Now, Caiaphas's predecessor, right before him, was his father-in-law, Annas. He had just been the high priest. And so the high priest's home here consisted of both the living quarters for Caiaphas, the current high priest, and his father-in-law, Annas. And so when they brought Jesus to the home of the high priest, Luke doesn't record this, but John 18 does. They first bring him to the father-in-law, Annas, the high priest emeritus, if you will. They thought they could get a quick conviction that Annas would come up with a way in order to charge Jesus. It didn't work out the way they thought it would. Jesus didn't give them the testimony they wanted. So even though that was the first trial, Jesus before Annas, it was inconsequential. And that moves to the second trial of Jesus, Jesus before Caiaphas. They take Jesus away from Annas. They go across the courtyard where Peter was out waiting to see what was going to happen. And he stands before Caiaphas, the current high priest. Now, we don't have a record in Luke of what happened at that trial, but Mark tells us in Mark 14. So hold your place here and turn to Mark 14, beginning with verse, let's say, 57. And some stood up, and they began to give false testimony against Jesus, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and in three days I will build another made without hands. And not even in this respect was their testimony consistent. These false witnesses were tripping over one, one another in contradictions. And the high priest stood up and came forward and questioned Jesus, saying, Do you make no answer? What is it that these men are testifying against you? But Jesus kept silent and made no answer. Again, the high priest was questioning him and saying to him, Are you the Christ? the son of the blessed one. And Jesus said, I am. Don't let anybody tell you, teenagers, college students in college, that, oh, Jesus never claimed to be the Messiah. That's just something that was tacked on by some overzealous apostles later on. Right here, clearly, he says, I am. And then to add injury to insult, he quotes a verse from Daniel chapter 7 about the Messiah. He says, and you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with clouds of heaven. That's all Caiaphas needed to hear. And tearing his clothes, the high priest said, what further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. How does it seem to you? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. Now turn back over to Luke 22 where it picks up in verse 63. And the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him and beating him. 
And then they engaged in a sadistic version of blind man's bluff. They put a blindfold around him and started to strike him and say, prophesy, who is it that has hit you? And they were saying many other things against him, blaspheming. Isn't it ironic? They were accusing Jesus of blasphemy when in fact they were the ones guilty of blasphemy. They then took him from the house of Caiaphas for the third and final trial, the religious trial, and that is Jesus before the Sanhedrin. Look at verse 66. And when it was day, the council of elders of the people assembled, both chief priests and scribes, and they led him away to the council chamber. Are you the Messiah? Verse 67. And he said to them, if I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask a question, you will not answer. Why should I even bother to answer you? You don't want the truth. To quote Jack Nicholson and a few good men, you can't handle the truth. That's what he was saying to these Sanhedrin. But then he relented and he went ahead and answered. Verse 69. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. That is a quotation of Psalm 110, verse 1. Another messianic psalm. Jesus was saying, one day you will see me seated before the right hand of God the Father. Now, that was blasphemy. That a mere man says, I will be seated at the right hand of a transcendent God. That's all they needed to hear. Pontius Pilate is a very interesting character in secular history. Pilate was the prefect. He was the governor of Judea. He was appointed by Tiberius, the Roman emperor, to rule over the area of Judea on behalf of Rome. Now, the job of a governor was twofold, to keep order, and he was given a military to do that, and secondly, to collect taxes. That's all Rome wanted to do, keep order and collect the taxes. And so you understand why it is Pilate feels threatened, as you'll see in just a moment. Now, Pilate lived most of the year in a palace at Caesarea. Caesarea by the sea, we call it. It's not Caesarea Philippi, it's Caesarea by the sea. Just a few months ago, a whole group of us went to this Caesarea by the sea. They've done great excavations there, and much of what Pilate had has been excavated there. I might point out to you that like Caiaphas, for 1,900 years, nobody in secular history, believed there was such a person as Pontius Pilate. They said, there's one more myth in the Bible, Pontius Pilate. There's no record of that. But in 1961, in Caesarea by the Sea, an Italian archaeologist discovered what today we call the Pilate Stone. It was a stone, and on the inscription there, it names Pontius Pilate as the governor of Judea exactly during the years that Christ was alive and ministered. One more of the many confirmations from archaeology of Scripture. Now, Pilate stayed at Caesarea by the sea, but because it was Passover, he came to Jerusalem. After all, there were two million plus Jews in Jerusalem for the Passover. He needed to come there in order to maintain order. We're now at about 7.30 on Friday morning before the crucifixion at 9 o'clock. Remember, Pilate is at the Praetorium. He's probably holding the trial outside in the courtyard because it's not just the Sanhedrin there. It's the throngs of Jews who are there too to listen to this. Look at verse 13. And Pilate summoned the chief priest and the rulers and the people and said to them, you brought this man to me as one who incites the people to rebellion. And behold, having examined him before you, I have found no guilt in this man regarding the charges which you make against him. No, nor his Herod, for he's sending back to us. And behold, nothing deserving death has been done by him. I therefore will punish him and release him. We'll give him a flogging, and that'll be the end of it. Not according to the people. They would have none of that. Look at verse 17. Now, Pilate was obliged to release to them at least one prisoner at the feast. Every year at Passover, 
the Romans showed their respect for the Jewish people by releasing one of their prisoners. It was symbolic, just as the Jews had been released from Egyptian slavery at the original Passover. So Rome said, we will release one of your prisoners from our bondage. It's our tip of the hat to you, the Jews. Pilate thought, surely this could take care of the Jesus matter. He said, remember the custom? I get to release one prisoner. Surely you want me to release Jesus, don't you? Look at verse 18. But they cried out all together, saying, away with this man and release for us Barabbas. He was one who had been thrown into prison for a certain insurrection made in the city and for murder. Here is a man who is actually guilty of trying to topple the Roman Empire. But Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, addressed them again. But they kept on calling out, saying, crucify, crucify him. And he said to them the third time, why, what evil has this man done? I found in him no guilt demanding death. I will therefore punish him and release him. Pilate was beginning to sense something's wrong here. I mean, after all, if Jesus was really guilty of leading an insurrection against Rome, shouldn't the Jewish people be coronating him instead of wanting to crucify him? That's what they wanted, a political leader who would lead a rebellion. Why are they so angry against Jesus They were insistent, and finally Pilate had had enough, verse 24, and Pilate pronounced the sentence that their demand should be granted, and he released the man that they were asking for who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, but he delivered Jesus to their will. Barabbas was the one intended to die that day, the one who was truly guilty, But they released him and sentenced Jesus to the cross. And that leads to the crucifixion of Jesus. Perhaps dating back to the times of the Medes and the Persians, crucifixion was the most horrible form of death ever invented by man. In fact, it was so terrible, no Roman citizen was ever crucified. It was reserved for slaves and insurrectionists like Barabbas. Victims of crucifixion not only suffered the painful torture of being suspended by their hands and feet, they also suffered the torture of weather, insects, birds of prey that would come and land on their head and peck out their eyes or peck at the open wounds. Victims of crucifixion often lingered and lived on the cross for days. There are some cases in which they lasted for weeks on that cross. Beginning in verse 33, we find the description of the crucifixion of Jesus. These are truly holy words. And because of that, I'm not going to make any comment. Just read along with me, beginning with verse 33. And when they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing up his garments among themselves. And the people stood by looking on. And even the rulers were sneering at him, saying, he saved others. Let him save himself if this is the Christ of God, his chosen one. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming up to him, offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Now there was also an inscription above him. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the criminals who was hanged there was hurling abuse at him saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered, rebuking him and said, do you not even fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly, I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. 
And it was now about the sixth hour and darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. The sun being obscured and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And Jesus crying out with a loud voice said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his life last. We've read these words, many of us, for years. Somehow we may have become numb to them, not realizing what really happened at the crucifixion. Someone has written a medical description of what happened to Jesus physically during his scourging and during his crucifixion. Preparations for the scourging are carried out. The prisoner is stripped of his clothing and his hands tied to a post above his head. The Roman legionnaire steps forward with his whip in his hand. This is a short whip consisting of several heavy leather thongs with two small balls of lead attached to the ends of each. The heavy whip is brought down with full force again and again across Jesus' shoulders, back, and legs. At first, the heavy thongs cut through the skin only. Then, as the blows continue, they cut deeper into the tissues, producing first an oozing of blood from the capillaries and the veins of the skin, and finally spurting arterial bleeding from vessels in the underlying muscles. The small balls of lead first produce large, deep bruises, which are broken open by subsequent blows. Finally, the skin of the back is hanging in long ribbons, and the entire area is an unrecognizable mass of torn, bleeding tissue. When it is determined by the centurion in charge that the prisoner is near death, the beating is stopped. The heavy beam of the cross is then tied across his shoulders, and the procession of the condemned Christ, two thieves in the execution detail, begins its slow journey. The weight of the heavy wooden beam together with the shock produced by copious blood loss is too much. Jesus stumbles and falls. The rough wood of the beam gouges into the lacerated skin and muscles of his shoulders. He tries to rise, tries to rise but human muscles have been pushed beyond their endurance. At Golgotha, the beam is placed on the ground and Jesus is quickly thrown backward with his shoulders against the wood. The legionnaire feels for the depression in the front of his wrist. He then drives a heavy, square, wrought iron nail through the wrist and deep into the wood. Quickly, he moves to the other side and repeats the action, being careful not to pull the arms too tightly, but to allow some movement. The beam is then lifted in place at the top of the posts, and the title reads, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, is nailed in place. As the arms fatigue, great waves of cramps sweep over the muscles, knotting them in deep, relentless, throbbing pain. With these cramps comes the inability to push himself upward. Hanging by his arms, the pectoral muscles are unable to act. Air can be drawn into the lungs, but cannot be exhaled. Jesus fights to raise himself in order to get even one short breath. Finally, carbon dioxide builds up in the lungs and in the bloodstream, and the cramps partially subside. Spasmodically, he is able to push himself upward to exhale. Hours of this limitless pain, cycles of twisting, joint cramps, intermittent partial asphyxiation, searing pain as tissue is torn from his lacerated back as he moves up and down across the rough timber. He can feel the chill of death creeping through his tissues. With one last surge of strength, he once again presses his torn feet against the nail straightens his legs, takes a deeper breath, and utters his seventh and last cry. Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. 
And as horrendous, as excruciating as that physical pain was, it was nothing compared to the spiritual pain he experienced of bearing the sins of the world, of bearing your sins and my sins, experiencing something he had never experienced before, separation from God his Father. For on that cross, meant for Barabbas, someone else, someone innocent would die in his place, the Lord Jesus Christ. Just as he died for you and for me. The Bible says God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. How can we ever thank God enough for what he has done for us? As we close this service today, I thought, how, how do we close the service like this? I think the only way to rightfully close the service like this is to express our gratitude, our thankfulness for what Jesus did for us on that horrible, excruciating, wondrous cross out of which comes our salvation.